Hello and welcome to the Swan Song Project podcast. My name is Ben Buddy Slack and I'm the founder of the Swan Song Project. We're a charity that helps people face the end of their lives to write and record their own original songs. This podcast features a range of songwriters and we talk about one of their songs, they share with us a songwriting tip that might be useful for new songwriters and they also share with us a song that's meaningful to them in some way related to bereavement. This episode features Carol Hodge and I hope you enjoy it. Okay, today I'm here with Carol Hodge. Thanks for joining me, Carol. Hello. Thank you for asking me. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you very much. I like your backdrop as well. That's cool. Yeah, it's my... Um, I've got a few of them because I teach from home and I get so bored of like seeing myself on the screen with like the same <laughs> backdrop. So this is the... This is like the second week of this one. So I'm kind of like got them on rotation. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice. I like it. <laughs> Uh, so if anyone's seen these podcasts before, uh, we're doing the three sections. First, we're going to have one of my guest songs. Uh, Carol's going to tell us a little bit about how she wrote it. Uh, then section two, we have a songwriting tip that might be useful for you or aspiring songwriters. And then section three, we're going to talk about a song that's meaningful to Carol in some way related to bereavement. So um, I'll ask Carol to introduce introduce this song of yours, please. Yeah, so this is the opening track of my new album. Uh, the album's called Savage Purge. And this song is called Stop Worrying Baby. Get into the car like clockwork Trying not to overthink each turn and there can only be one destination With so many routes, so many things to learn And the last time I got so burned I still feel the heat around me like a fire And if I've just one life to live And if I know Some beats down like another country But my heart don't know its name And I'm so used to this separation I can't remember any other way And the next time Will it be worth The pain that I go through to make and if I've just one life to live And if I know I'll die alone Then just stop worrying, baby And go and do it all on your own The acid reflux of my future grows it's burning in my mouth The terror of another wasted year Well it leaves me with no doubt That if I've just one life to live and if I know I'll die alone Then just stop worrying, baby Yeah, just stop worrying, baby Yeah, just stop worrying, baby And go and do it all
Okay, great stuff. So that was Stop Worrying Baby by Carol Hodge. So what can you tell us about writing that? It's the new, the first track off the new album. Yeah. Um, so I wrote this one. I tend to write quite a lot when I'm doing something a little bit repetitive. So maybe I, I, I go for a lot of walks in the countryside. So I tend to get ideas when I'm walking, you know, after I've been going for a couple of hours, I tend to get things coming into my head. And also driving is a big one for me. So this song um, I wrote whilst driving. Um, I was living in Huddersfield, um, but I was teaching in, um, in Manchester. So on that commute sort of over the, um, I think it's like the A A62 and over the hills through Oldham and down into Manchester. Um, and yeah, just, I, I remember it was over the course of a few days, I sort of got the original idea uh, and um, I tend to just sing things over and over again until they sort of, you know, develop. And obviously if I'm sat at home, I'll, I'll sort of keep playing piano along with them until things sort of slide into place. Um, just keep going over and over and over until something that I like happens. Um, so yeah, I wrote that over, over the course of a few days um, on that commute. Um, and then I filmed the music video on that same stretch of road because I thought that would be quite a nice, um, oh, nice sort of full circle event. Yeah. So you wrote, um, did you, so doing your writing when you were driving, did you write all the, all the lyrics that way or did you like come up with the chorus and then write the lyrics separately or were you just singing it and memorising it as you went? Yeah, I was, I was singing it and memorising it. Um, I actually wrote um, the two, well, there's, there's, two, there's two verses to it. Um, I actually wrote it initially as one long verse. And then when I came to record it, um, I thought it actually worked better, like repeating the intro riff and then going into a like, sort of slightly shorter verses. Um, I'm a big fan now of trying to keep it relatively... <laughs> simple um, so yeah so that verse one became verse one and verse two and then i wrote the midsection as, when i was recording the album i sort of had an idea of the melody but i hadn't come up with the vocals for that part so that was a, a late edition oh nice yeah it's really an interesting way of writing it i agree completely that like the sometimes it's easy to be more creative in you know it's easier to write when you're not sat at a desk or in a place where you expect to write um but then my problem is i always forget stuff uh like if I was driving and trying to come up with stuff like that, I think I just, uh, did, were you doing it like you come up with a line or two and then just repeat it until it's stuck in your head or have you got a just really good memory anyway? Well, I've, I've improved my memory through, through doing things like that actually. <laughs> um, but yeah, I tend to just repeat it. And if I'm, you know, if, if I get a, a stop, I'll get the voice recorder on my phone and just sing mm -hmm. it all into there. And then I'll save that and then I'll carry on. And again, like, you know, next time I stop, I'll record it all into my phone. Because um, obviously it's a bit of a nightmare. You can't really do that when you're driving. You know, trying to like pause it and like, you know, re-record it. It's a bit, a bit too dangerous. So yeah, at rest stops, I'll, I'll record what I've got. That's a good, yeah, an interesting way. Have you done that before with other songs? Or is that the first time you've done it? Yeah, a few, a few quite a few songs, yeah. Um, another thing that I tend to do is if I've recorded you know, an idea, like a piano idea for something, but I haven't got any vocals, um, or I've got an idea for a vocal line, but no lyrics, I'll record that onto my phone and play it as I'm driving and listen, mm. you know, just keep repeating it over until things sort of start to fall into place. I, th I think it's, um, I read somewhere that it's to do with um, when you're doing something repetitive and physical, your brain goes into a slightly zen meditative state, so you're not over focused on one thing you're kind of splitting your focus between the two i don't know if do you drive yeah yeah so i don't know about you but when i drive it's almost like i'm in a bit of a bubble i'm in a slightly different headspace to normal i'm not like hyper alert because you especially if you've been driving for like 20 years you just kind of get into a um almost like a sort of you know muscle memory state where you don't have to think about what you're doing physically but obviously you're aware of everything but you're not focused acutely on one thing so it's quite an interesting uh, mental state to be in I think. Yeah yeah it feels like it kind of allows that creative part of the brain to work in a different way. I always think that in terms of like I feel less like I'm putting less pressure on myself if I'm doing something else. I think using the dishes or just little kind of yeah little simple tasks that 
don't require too much attention, but just keep you occupied, then it feels like the creative part of the brain can run a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. And it seems to be like that. Um, I think I think you're absolutely right, but the lack of pressure mm. is a big thing as well. Because I don't know about you, but if I sit down and go, right, I'm going to write a song now, like very rarely does something good happen. It's like I can get something out and often I'll get a starting point for something if I do that. And I think you, the more the more you show up for your art and the more you sit down and write and are disciplined about doing that regularly, then obviously you're going to improve. But, um, you know, the magic sometimes comes when you least expect it. So you've got to be ready for it. Yeah, <laughs> good tricks of it. And you say um, the album and the video, are they out now and are they available for people to check out? Yeah, so the, the video for uh, Stop Worrying Baby, um, like I said, I film, it was filmed sort of near, sort of between Huddersfield and Oldham, basically, on that sort of stretch of countryside. And um, it's it features um, Dominic Brunt, who plays Paddy from in, in Emmerdale. Um, so yeah, that was that was quite a coup getting him on board. So he he's in it and he he plays like I, I basically had this idea of um, I I wanted a male character in it and I wanted it to be unclear as to whether I'm imagining him and like what he represents and who he is and whether he's a a benign character or a sinister one. So I just basically said like it's going to be a bit like this and we don't know if you're real or not. Is that all right? And he was like, yeah. <laughs> so obviously because he's like a really a actor he came up you know he played it perfectly it's like it's quite hard to explain like i mean i had loads of reference points and i was like oh it's like this david lynch film it's like this coen brothers film and i want to capture this vibe um but to actually accurately explain that to someone else is um is quite difficult so i was really pleased he nailed that yeah and the album's out as well it officially goes online um on the 30th of june next week um but it's available for pre-order like cd and red vinyl uh from my website now so yeah, yeah. it's it's out there cool well, i'll put links for that in the description and uh, some of the videos on youtube so people can watch it cool cool, cool. cool. Uh, yeah it's oh, sorry yeah it's yeah yeah <laughs> cool. we've got a bit, a bit of a delay but we're all right <laughs> good stuff um so let's move into section two now shall we so this is where i ask my guests to share out a songwriting tip that might be useful for you are aspiring songwriters, so uh, what would your tip for us be, Carol? Hmm. Well, kind of, I guess what I've already touched on is um, always have a, a recording device to hand because you never know when you're going to get an idea. Um, and another time when I particularly get ideas is when I'm just about to fall asleep or when I'm just waking up. So that hip, hypnopompic or hypnogogic state um, and having my phone on my bedside cabinet, just like being there and just grabbing it and recording, you know, because um, you always think you're going to remember it and you never do. Well, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> so you always have something to record. And um, yeah, just get, try and get a routine going, like practice and don't, um, don't be too hard on yourself. Like let an idea develop, even if you never, nobody else ever hears it, it that, that process will still be helpful to you in the long run and um, so just yeah just keep practicing just keep writing like say even if it's a load of rubbish just keep doing it and eventually you'll find something that you like so yeah that's really good uh, really good advice thanks for that carol um are you are you pretty disciplined with yourself or what's it i, I, I try i'm terrible for that like i've got to sleep I'm like oh this would be a really good idea i'll remember it and I, I know i should get up and write it down but i just never get myself out of bed <laughs> are you pretty good at, at getting them down yeah, I, I tend to, um, I've grown a little bit um, less self-conscious of it now. So I will just like, if I'm out and about walking somewhere, I'll just sing something in my phone and, you know, people walk, <laughs> walking past with walking the dog or something and I'm just going, yeah, da, 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 like into a phone. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, yeah, I'm, I'm quite good at that. Less, um, less disciplined with like, you know, the regular songwriting. I tend to just like, if I've got, some spare time i'll be like right i'm gonna go and sit and write um but i think since since lockdown began i've actually had a bit more of a routine which is unusual for me because i'm off on tour quite a lot so a lot of the time i'm either teaching or touring or rehearsing you know so i've actually had a bit more time to write so that's been quite nice 
that's good there, making it make good productive use of the time. Great stuff. Um, so let's move into the third part now. So this is where I ask my guests to share with us a song that's meaningful to them in some way related to bereavement. Um, so what I'll do now is I'll ask Carol to introduce it and I'll put the link in the description. So if you're listening to this, uh, you want to check out the song, you can follow that link and we'll listen and then come back to us. So uh, what song did you choose for us here, Carol? So I've chosen the song uh, Nights in White Satin by the Moody Blues. Yeah, it's a great song. Um, what made you choose that one? Well, I found it quite hard to choose. Um, I mean, there's a few songs that I relate to bereavement and a few songs that um, trigger memories of a certain person or, um, you know, a certain time. Um, this was... I, I, I associate this with um, with John Kay, who was um, the manager of the very first band I was in, and more importantly, the dad of our keyboard player, who's also called John Kay, who is still a really good friend of mine to this day. Um, and uh, it's it's kind of like bittersweet memories because you know he passed away. I think it was about five years ago now, and. Uh, at the time when we were first starting out as musicians, we did quite a lot of covers and uh, he was always, you know, sort of trying to get his oar in and trying to give <laughs> us some uh, ideas of who to cover. We were like, oh, let's do this Nirvana song or let's do this Green Day song or this No Doubt song. And he was like, oh, what about the uh, the Moody Blues? And we'd just be like, you know, sniggering, thinking it was hilarious. Um, and he'd always talk about light and shade. He's like, oh, I listen to a Moody Blues song, there's loads of light and shade. So um, that became a catchphrase. It's like, oh, we need more light and shade in this song. Um, but really, you know, looking back, it was, you know, obviously when you're 16, you f you're so excruciatingly self-conscious and like, um, you know, any sort of uh, suggestion that you might listen to another song that's not by Green Day is just like met with derision and like, you know, you find any, any adults who try and give you advice are just like hilariously, you know, out of touch or whatever. Um, but yeah, I just, just kind of associate that with him. And now when I hear it, it's, it's quite nice because there's, there's a sadness to it. Cause I think, I think they played a Moody Blues song at his funeral. Um, I can't remember if it was nice and what it's like, it might've been another one. Um, so it does remind me of him in that way, obviously after he's passed and it's quite sad, but, um, also it's quite a sort of, um, yeah, quite a sort of tongue in cheek memory as well, which I think is quite nice. And it sums up our relationship as well. Cause you know, I knew him as an adult. But it was it was there was always that sort of you know childlike uh, association with him. Yeah, <laughs> that's a really nice story. I really like uh, one of the things I really like about doing this podcast and doing this section of people is hearing all these different. So yeah, like when and when I hear the song beforehand, and then you think about it, but then obviously everyone's got such a unique um, relationship with that song and and those kind of stories of um, what they mean to them that way. So I really uh, enjoy hearing them. <laughs> yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. And that's like that's the power of music isn't it it's um you know the same song could could you know will conjure up a completely different memory for you as it will for me as it will for the next person um and that might have been you know completely out of the intention of the songwriter as well because it's that magical thing of like once you put a song out there into the world it belongs to everyone and it's they make their associations with it and they have their memories connected to it and their emotions connected to it so it's uh quite a cool thing yeah definitely i think it kind of links to you know what you're saying earlier about people not being too hard on themselves when they're writing songs a lot of the time i think you can um write something and you might be intending for something that you're not quite hit but it might really resonate with someone else in a different way and um there's been a few of that on here where you know, yeah you say songs that aren't, aren't meant to mean a certain thing but have filled that you know meant that to someone else and it's been very valuable to them it's it's hard to know what they're going to do when you let a song out <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah and and people are but i quite like um i quite like ambiguity yeah. as a listener and as a songwriter I, I i tend to prefer you know lyrics that are a little bit more like i say a little bit more ambivalent not quite on the nose could mean one thing could mean another um i think they tend to be the songs that people get most out of because they can sort of like i say imprint their own associations onto them quite easily yeah, definitely. Definitely. Great stuff. Yeah, thanks a lot for joining me, Carol. It's been uh, nice to talk to you. And, no um, thanks for having Yeah, pleasure. And are you doing much um, any, uh, live streams or anything coming up? Uh, 
Um, yeah, I've got one on the, when is it? Let me just double check. Uh, the 4th of July. Is that right? The 4th of July. Yeah, 4th of July. Um, I'm playing a set for um, Punk for the Homeless online. Um, they do a lot of fundraising for an orphanage in Sierra Leone, um, which is really cool. And it's like literally the girls at the orphanage will be watching the live streams and like making comments and sending photos of themselves. Um, so it's just like, I think a lot of the time when people do things for charity, it feels like it's one step removed and it's quite an mm. abstract thing, you know, when you raise money. But to actually see like, the, the, I did another gig for them a couple of months ago and the money from that gig went straight to them. And within a week, they had photos of all the girls with a new pair of shoes and some of them had never owned a pair of their own shoes before. So it was just like so heartwarming to see that direct connection between doing a gig and then literally a week later that money has gone directly to these girls and it's helping them yeah that must be really satisfying that sounds great yeah so i'll um well i'll tag your page and everything in here as well and links to your website and stuff so anyone watching this wants to go and follow carol and check out the live stream on july 4th uh, you can do sounds sounds, sounds great good stuff awesome yeah oh, very cool. welcome <laughs> Yeah, thanks a lot for joining me, Carol. And uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. I'll be back with another episode soon.